Um, I want to look at us uh, for a second at our glorious past in spine surgery. Um, as a profession, we've done more in the last hundred years than uh, almost any field of medicine. Uh, we started out being basically helpless in the face of spinal pathology and ended up being able to uh, help the uh, crippled walk, um, help the deformed stand straight. Um, we were able to uh, take tumors out of the spine, decompress nerve roots, uh, fix horrific trauma. Um, we went nuts in the 1980s. Um, and even into the early 2000s, we taught computers how to operate with us. Uh, we learned how to preserve and restore motion. And then, nothing. Except the economist started to call us unscrupulous. The same journal accused us of being part of a spine industrial complex. Aetna told its patients that 87% of our surgeries fail. The Wall Street Journal said that uh, we're all about marketing and greed, that we reap royalties and Medicare bounty. Steve Kerr told uh, everyone to stay away from spine surgery. He said, don't let, anyone, don't let anyone in there. He said, rehab, rehab, rehab. Our own journals said that our procedures no, are no better than the sham, sham surgeries that we perform. So what happened? How did we fall from grace? Why were we not celebrated as heroes? I've spent the last several years discussing how our profession suffered from a crisis of fragmentation, inefficiency, and obsolescence, uh, where the patient ended up getting the short end of the stick. We discussed how one of the reasons why our fall from grace was due to flagging innovation that we do the same procedures now that we did two decades ago. We use the same devices that we did two decades ago. We learned that innovation is powered by drive and funding, and we seem to have lost both. Uh, we fell behind due to shifting public opinion, wavering financial support for our science, global competition, and a suffocating regulatory environment. We learned that our healthcare system itself is highly entrenched. It's cutting edge, but it's inefficient. And it's run by third party insurance cartels, basically, where high cost and outcomes are not great. And the clinical discretion of the doctor and the central position of the patient are increasingly in jeopardy. We learned that. Innovation has little to do with the healthcare system and everything to do with the freedom that's in the system. We're innovative when it's about the consumer, when the patient's free to create demand for excellent care and the doctor's free to fulfill that demand, we flourish. We learned that everything we were doing in the hospital as concerns spine surgery was wrong. And it took our leaving the hospital and going to the so-called ambulatory surgery centers to discover that. Everything from the way we approach patients to the types of surgeries that we do, to the anesthesia that we employ, to the biologics we use, to the philosophies of hospitalization itself were wrong. And that we could change culture, remove wasteful processes, have a stake in the economics of the healthcare system, and deliver cheap, efficient, and patient-focused care. But then it became apparent that our biggest problem was not the system or the context or the institution or the devices that we used. Our biggest problem might be us, the surgeons. In 1999, the Harvard Business Review published a piece about why successful companies fail. And the, the, failure of the, the failure of the system to change had to do with the leaders of that system not being able to recognize change when it happened. Innovative thinking that led to the initial success 
eventually crystallizes into a rigid devotion to the status quo. They named four things, framework, process, relationship, and belief. Framework is the way in which we approach a problem, our mindset, our playbook, our core operating principles, and it determines our behavior and our culture. It's how we view the world and eventually how the world views us. And in spine surgery, we approach spinal pathology with crude, bloody surgeries, with long hospital stays, with a devotion to MRI and CT scans, but without an emphasis on what that meant to the patient's lifestyle or his needs. Processes. The steps and procedures that drive the day-to-day -day activity, our sense of order, what made us successful in the first place. But in spine surgery, our rigid adherence to the processes that no longer made sense. Foley's in every patient, A-lines in every patient, a reliance on x-rays, hospitalization, post-operative immobilization protocols that didn't make sense, led to inefficiency and ultimately to our failing to grow with our patients' needs. Process for the sake of process, but not for the patient. Relationships. These are the networks of people and organizations that make a company or a profession functional. Our patients, our colleagues, our allied professionals, hospitals, the public, and probably most controversially, the industry. In Spine, we became constrained by our relationships with hospitals, with industry, and when we ignore, don't grow with our key relationships, which is the patient and the public, we become irrelevant, ineffective, out of touch, and so we fail. And finally, beliefs. These are deeply held values that define us as a profession. They give us purpose and they form the blueprint upon which we can make and do great things. But for, for us, over time, these beliefs became dogma. Donald Saul of the London School of Business described the process as a hardening into rigid rules and regulations that define legitimacy simply because they're enshrined in precedent and their unifying power degenerates into reactionary tendencies. And so we have only to remember 10 years ago when artificial disc replacement came out, how we all reacted. Despite the fact that artificial disc replacement was based on a principle that was pretty important, motion preservation, and it could have allowed us to evolve in much more beneficial ways than what we could uh, uh, offer our patients had we been a little bit more receptive. So I have an example to give you about car racing. So Formula One is the highest class of automobile racing in the world. These are the fastest cars. In fact, these cars are probably the closest that man has come to creating something that's living and breathing. The word formula, in fact, refers to a set of core principles and rules that define this profession and the teams that, um, that race them. There is a, an event during a race called a pit maneuver where a car has to go into a special stall during the race and be um, maintained, repaired, tires changed, fueled. This is what a pit maneuver looked like in 1950. To refuel and change tires. Lou Moore himself changes the tires. Only four crew members, including the driver, are allowed to work on the car. It's a tense time. Holland stays in his seat, anxious to get away. Let's watch.
So I just want you to look at how many people are there that are doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> and how one person is essentially doing all the work, but how crudely he's doing that work. So it's important to see that. And this is what that same maneuver looks like in 2014. So there is not a single person in that scene that isn't doing anything. Everyone's doing something. So Formula One, over the years, has become a model of how to do things in terms of logistics, efficiency, adaptability, safety, innovation. And it brings in billions of dollars for its industry. And its public opinion, unlike ours, is extraordinarily high, although the stakes are just the same. It's one of the most dangerous sports. <coughs> It demonstrates how an organization can have rules, can have an ethos, but innovate within the context of these rules to become truly great. And it largely has to do with the commitment of its practitioners to change. So if there is to be a spine surgery for the new century, if we are to be relevant, there are certain pillars that we have to work on. We have to be technologically advanced in everything we do. We have to concentrate on restoring patients' lives, not fusing their lives. It has to be about the patient and all about the patient. It has to be super efficient. Everything we do, from the surgeries we do to the time it takes to do the surgeries, to the recovery, to the process, to the post-operative, to the pre-operative. And everything we do has to make sense. It has to have value. It has to create value. So if we're so efficient and so valuable and so easy and so rapid, we become fashionable. What we really have in spine surgery, fundamentally, even more fundamentally than our lack of innovation, is our public relations problem which is unfortunate because I've spent the last 10 years rubbing elbows with what are arguably the most talented surgeons in the profession, dedicated, day in and day out, doing a service to their patients and doing it beautifully and brilliantly. Spine surgery, despite all that, has to be appealing to our patients. We have to stop doing the surgeries that, that don't work and innovate surgeries that do work with an adherence to efficiency, value, technological brilliance, and most importantly, to the needs of the patient, and then make sure that people know about it. Thank you.